through to the last speaker, what a challenge to face when he says he's the final voice in the dying moments of the conference in the graveyard. I'm not quite sure where that puts me. You can think of me as the voice from over the river Styx, if I've got my logic. Um, a couple of declarations. One, I'm not an archaeologist. I'm not an archaeologist. So some of this is quite new to me and maybe not to you. And secondly, I'm not going to play back everything that you've heard earlier today. I'm going to try and extract one or two of the essences of what I think I've heard. I thought it was more than interesting that we start such an event with a quote that archaeology is neither particularly useful nor necessary. Not necessary. Necessary. And I haven't been near the wrong at all. <laughs> but of course, what we find is that archaeology is both of these things. And providing a proper sound evidence base for what actually happened in the past, which on more than one occasion contradicted or even disproved myths that have become embedded in popular culture and assumed the status of facts. For example, the early designations of natural parks in the US were exclusively focused on preserving natural heritage, literally at the expense of families who were actually removed from such areas. But archaeology later proved the evidence that the human cultural history of such areas was every bit as important as their natural heritage and had existed for much longer than had earlier been believed. We heard another example where the myth was that the history of an area in the north west corner, northeast corner of America only really began with the arrival of settlers when in fact the archaeology provided evidence that the dominant culture had been that of the native Indian and had been there for much longer than had been expected. Another strand was that the evidence of the past can affect the present and therefore possibly the future. We heard that in Ulster, archaeology and other research meant that some new narratives of the past were emerging, narratives that undermined some of the myths on which some very significant contemporary behaviours were certainly based. And this is obviously particularly resonant in a community like Northern Ireland, where the shadows of the past are particularly long and in some cases dark, and as we discovered, previously impenetrable. I thought it was inspiring that the Cory Mila Reconciliation Centre was now exploring and using some of these tales. We heard too from Robert Corbett that in his community, research showed that Irish and Scottish communities had in fact lived side by side, contrary to popular belief. We heard too that this had led to more open and more meaningful conversations between the two sides of a divide. And I think we may therefore conclude that archaeology is both useful and necessary. I'm having a difficulty with that word today. I'll try not to need it. Another strand that emerged for me was the value of collaboration. I was struck by how many speakers from local groups referred to the value added to their projects by the involvement of professionals and academics, and I thought this was refreshing and encouraging, and we heard not a single hint of any tensions that these collaborations might have generated. I was surprised by that. And the results of these collaborations included guiding the group to look wider, both physically and historically, than they might have done, assistance in accessing resources such as documents and archives that might have seemed beforehand to be out of reach or impenetrable. Another thing for me that emerged today was the impact of the past on the present, and I've hinted at this earlier. We heard the story of the demonstrations in 1889 at Berehi and the resulting bills for access to mountains and hills, and although unsuccessful, these represented a line that can be traced straight to our right to roam legislation, the land reform bills and the Community Empowerment Act, and all started at the back of Berehi, to paraphrase a popular song, which I will not be persuaded to sing later. <laughs> I'm not going to further distill the one-minute madness. I think that further distillation of such rich blends would result in a malt of such high proof as to be unpalatable. I was getting carried away here, obviously. But I will mention one. I thought that the Scottish Scotland's Urban Past Youth Forum presentation was inspiring. I could not write fast enough to capture everything that Katie and her group was engaged with. Just take a look at the age profiles of people sitting around you today. Young people like Katie and others are the future for our past. I noticed too that the involvement of young people was also a feature of the project called the Gateway to the Cullens, where someone boasted that every, I think she said, S1 pupil had been involved in doing something in that project, and I found that equally rewarding. I was encouraged by the sense of groups getting on and doing their own thing. I grew up as a planner. You can spend the rest of your bloody life planning the future, but you may not get to it unless you get on with it. And what I really liked was people's sense of getting on and doing their thing, not waiting for someone else to do it for them. I like the tale of the Enchinan group who didn't want to be entertained by speakers, but who wanted to do something. Great. Get on with it. So, some pointers for the future. Thank you, Ila, for letting me know yesterday afternoon that you wanted me to think about this. <laughs> it might again be revealing my newness to this subject, but it seems to me there's an enormous scope for archaeology and history to open some new narratives of our past that may help us all better understand who we are and the light of very recent events. Some more understanding might be helpful. Collaboration is a really valuable thing, so if you're a local group embarking on something, don't be afraid to go to your local college or university and hassle your academics. These are public servants, you're paying their wages. Go along and see them, they'll love you for it eventually. <laughs> 
And you won't be surprised to hear that my third and final strand is young people. Get them involved. They're the future for our past. We have to remember that they too have a past, so get them more engaged with it. And it would be impossible for me to stand here. I haven't yet fully party company my head with the Heritage Lottery Fund, and I was delighted to see how many of the projects around here had HLF support. In fact, some of them were my decisions. So people often say to me, what is the thing I can do best? What's the golden tip to improve my chances of getting money from HLF? It's simple. Buy more bloody tickets. <laughs> it's enough for me. I've also been asked to make some thanks for uh, those involved in the conference. First to the management staff of the Ethel Palace Hotel, who are looking after us for so well. Some of us are having dinner here tonight, so we're investing in the future, as you can see. <laughs> to our sponsors, to Circ Environment Scotland, Kathleen and Ross Heritage Trust, the Association of Local Government Archaeological Officers. To the staff of HES, as I think we're learning to call it, and Archaeology Scotland, and our team for organising the weekend. To our speakers, chairs, workshop organisers, and exhibitors. But most of all, thanks to you, all of you who came here and made this such an inspiring day. I, for one, certainly enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.